is just data being removed um, from where it was stored. And you might think, oh, that, you know, doesn't that sound kind of vague in general? It gets people in huge problems legally, and I'll tell you why. Second thing is data being inserted um, for by somebody because they think it would be helpful or, you know, they want to take this out and put that there. It's a huge problem. It is a form of manipulation in a legal context. Third one, uh, data being converted into one format from another. Just think when you're sending email from one person to another, how many servers that email transfer goes through, and in the transmission, what might happen to the coding of that document. Fourth, uh, innocent manipulation. That could be an example of it. If I send you an email, and somehow the email systems that I'm using and what you're using are different, and the servers have different versions of Unicode on them, it might show up a little different in your mailbox than it did from the mailbox where I sent it. And i got to tell you, a lot of people don't understand how that can happen and see it as an a example of manipulation. And in fact, the data is being manipulated, but it's really very innocent. Nobody's trying to do anything nefarious. Erroneous interpretation of data attributes. You know, you can see me standing up here. I've got some gray hair, probably more gray than black at this point. But I can tell you, they're for the judges and the lawyers who we deal with, who are some of the most senior people in the field of jurisprudence, and who are smarter than I am and are very wise. And when they were growing up learning the law and learning evidence, there wasn't a computer near them. And at this point in time, they are often asked to make decisions and interpret attributes of data that seem very straightforward, but a lot of times uh, are subject to a, a, an erroneous interpretation as to what that means. It's a big category in my experience of, of making mistake. Manipulation to mislead investigators. Sometimes that is buried within the computer code itself and some of the malware incidents. We'll talk about that. And the last part is uh, malware residue. Um, sometimes uh, some of the most insidious types of malware that we've run into, I don't know what your experience is here, uh, will leave certain residue, or what do they call it now, data exhaust, uh, in the unallocated space of a hard drive. A lot of times people aren't paying attention to the importance of that kind of data and either don't copy it or you just ignore it or write over it, and it you know, can have very big implications. So those are sort of the categories that we're going to be talking about. Let me start with an example that's pretty straightforward. I imagine everybody here remembers the Enron scandals and the fraud that went on. One part of the fraud had to do with Enron trying to book more revenue and more income than it was entitled to by selling a barge. That's right, it was actually a, a maritime vessel. And they sold it to Merrill Lynch. Now, some of you may remember this incident. Some of you may not. And the way they sold it to Merrill Lynch was to say, well, we will sell this to you, Merrill Lynch, so that we will be able to book a gain. But Merrill Lynch really had no interest in buying the, the barge. So what Enron's uh, executive said, well, you know what, we'll sell it to you, but then we'll buy it back within 90 days. Now, there's probably nobody here that studies accounting. I'm an accountant <laughs> and a CPA. If I sell you something with an agreement to buy it back, it's not a sale. And if the accountants had known that the sale of that barge was accompanied by a repurchase agreement, they would not have allowed the sale to be booked as income. But do you think Merrill Lynch was going to do a deal like this without something written? <laughs> of course not. It's way too big of a deal, way too important. And a memo was written by one of the people in Enron that laid out the entire scheme, showed how it was going to work, that there would be a sale, what the, what the vessel was, when, how it would be sold, what the transaction would be, when it would be booked, what part of the business would receive the income, how it would be purchased back. And it was a great memo. Some people printed it. And during the criminal investigation after Enron failed, people were given copies of this memo in paper form. And the question is, all right, that's the paper form. <laughs> Where's the electronic version? became known as the Immaculate Conception Memo because nobody who handled it said that they wrote it, saw it, read it, remembered doing what, kind of, you know, where they saved it, and couldn't find it in the Enron records. But we did go to Merrill Lynch and able to 
um, use a couple of techniques, including cash value and, some, and other things, to search within the servers of Merrill Lynch to see if we could find this memo. Now, remember, we're already into a form of manipulation because somebody knows this is an electronic computer file, but they don't want anybody to find it. And we found it inside the home directory of one of the executives at Merrill Lynch who was a defendant in the criminal case. He was on trial. And the very fact that this document was inside his home directory, and I think it was actually a copy of a home directory, um, was devastatingly bad for him at trial. It showed a real sort of state of mind and intention. Now, that kind of knowledge and intent, you might think, well, is that really manipulation? You were manipulating things in the terms of the way the court sees it. This is a very easy, simple example. Because they believe that when someone says, here's all the memos and I don't have a copy of this, that you were telling the truth. And if it turns out, in fact, that you did have it, and it was within your, uh, your directory uh, on the network, it's really looking bad for you. Now, one of the interesting things about this is that when we, t when we introduced it for the government, we were working for the Enron Task Force at the time and introduced it. Um, the defendant's lawyer started to make claims against us after we introduced the document and said, well, you found the document, but was the document ever opened? Or was it just saved there without being open? All right, and we were able to answer that. And they said, all right, well, maybe, you, maybe he opened it, but how long was it open? Did he really read it? It's one thing to open a document. It's another thing to actually read it. And legally, these things matter. I mean, in fairness, if you open a, a document for a second and you close it, you really didn't read it. We were able to address all those points. And then the one thing we didn't count on, the challenge that we got into, was the um, that night, towards the end of our guy testifying all these things and explaining these things, the last thing we didn't count on was somebody saying, well, wait a minute, the kind of computer that was used back then was, had a monitor that only displayed so much text? And we believe that when the memo was opened, if you'll notice, the incriminating, the really bad information about how this deal worked was on the second page, which scrolled down farther. I know it's ridiculous. This is what you wind up against. So even though it was on this screen and even though he was viewing it, he probably, you can't prove that he read the text <laughs> that actually established the criminal intent here, and therefore you cannot show he knew that, and therefore he can't be guilty of it. Proceedings came to an end that night, and our guy spent all night running <laughs> down with her, you know, in his hotel room evidence to try to refute that. And actually, he was able to refute it, but the judge ended testimony, and we weren't able to get there. So my point in this is to just to show you that even when, as a matter of computer science, you think you're talking about you know, a memo, and here it is, and you know, so there's no manipulation, it is unbelievable what the legal system will put you through in trying to establish whether or not you manipulated the picture and, and over-interpreted the evidence or got it wrong in some way.